if you all don't mind. So for the, um, and the, that video recording is starting now. Um, so my relationship with Gießen started um, many years ago, right after uh, Gießen came out with their um, first roasting machine, which was a, um, uh, I believe a W6 Gießen. And I had always been roasting on other well-known um, roasters of a German uh, brand, uh, that doesn't need any further introduction. And I had specifically been roasting on um, the um, yeah the more the vintage roasting machines that uh, that uh, brand still um, distributes. And what was so interesting to me when I started roasting on that first test roast on that Gießen W6, I'm talking now about more than. Um, uh, 14 years ago, is that um, I just felt an amazing ability with that Gießen to control the roast. And um, what, what do I mean? What does it mean controlling the roast? Is that you can manipulate the profile, the beam temperature uh, time profile at any point in the game. And that's, um, I think, so powerful of the Gießen machines. And that, that made me fell, um, a fall in love with um, the Gießen um, system very quickly. Uh, so this is quite a few years ago. Gießen at that time was um, in the beginning stage of their um, technical development. And then from that, a, a relationship um, grew. And, and here I am. This is uh, Boot Coffee again. And we here have a training center and we are also uh, a test center for Gießen Roasters. On this call, we also have uh, David Sutfin, who is uh, the um, Gießen representative. He's based in um, Pennsylvania. Maybe David, uh, maybe you want to um, just introduce yourself. You're speaking through your your mobile phone. So Hi, maybe, good morning. Uh, yeah, yeah, just good maybe. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hey, nice it's a little bit you. louder, uh, David, because you're not coming through gotcha. very clearly. Oh, I think I have bad a bad connection, maybe. I'm at a hotel. Um, it's okay. But good morning, everyone. It's That's good. Can you hear? Yeah. Continue. Yeah. You want to just briefly introduce? Um, good morning. Your business and. So we are um, a uh, agent for um, North America um, and also, um, well, for the United States and for Canada, um, and we offer. Uh, sales, um, service, uh, support, um, and it's been two years now that uh, we're acting as agent for uh, Gießen Machine. Um, myself and many of you have met um, Katie Cates, who is my uh, colleague who also helps with tech support and sales for these machines. Um, and uh, myself, like Willem, um, have um, also fallen in love with the machines because of their capabilities to roast and um, I'm actually learning a lot of things now um, from Willem and this um, forum will be part of that so um, to help develop some of the profiles and capabilities of these machines. Great. And um, David, where are you based? What is your, um, what is your, where are your headquarters? So we're based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, on the East Coast, old industrial town. Cool. Um, so, and I will add a little bit more about my own uh, background is that um, I obviously, as you can uh, probably hear, 
Um, I, I am not originally from the US, I'm actually from Holland myself. Um, I grew up in a beautiful town called uh, Bern, which is in the, right in the center of Holland. And um, I started roasting at a very, very young age. Um, I was actually 14 when I roasted my first batch of coffee. And um, it's always cool to kind of um, show people w where you're from. And I will, um, in, a, in a minute, I will show you uh, the actual machine that I started roasting on because that was a, um, a roasting machine that my uh, dad built. Um, and that was a machine created for roasting samples. And he named that roasting machine uh, the golden coffee box. Um, and my first experience roasting coffee uh, on a real commercial machine was not too long um, after that. Um, and I gradually climbed up the, the hierarchy of um, being able to roast on uh, bigger machines. We, um, my dad, my brother and I, we collaborated in our family roasting business for a while. And um, at some point, uh, my brother and I, we um, took over the business. And obviously, roasting coffee was for us um, always our, our hallmark in our coffee business. Uh, we were ahead of the curve in terms of uh, what uh, some trends became later on in um, the world of specialty coffee. And that is that my dad, he relied and believes very much in um, uh, single origin coffees. Now, as you all know, in the um, world of coffee, single origin uh, is now a very normal and celebrated uh, aspect. But back in the 70s, the 1970s I'm talking about, you know, that was considered somewhat of, a, of an interesting out-of-the-box uh, concept. And so single origin coffees and understanding how, how to um, profile and roast those became kind of a, um, uh, a key aspect of uh, what our business focus was. Because imagine this, um, trying to roast and prepare a 100% Kenyan coffee uh, for a clientele that, um, for example, uses espresso or that uses this coffee in espresso bars. We had like one client, a chain, that really liked Kenyan coffee. So, you know, try to tame the acidity of such a coffee in order to make that coffee um, palatable as espresso can be a real, real challenge. And so my brother, my dad and, and I, we were doing, um, um, yeah, I would say limitless experiments to try to reveal the, the sweetness of that specific uh, Kenyan coffee. And there was the uh, repertoire of coffees that um, the Golden Coffee Box, as the company was also called, um, was uh, rolling out uh, with, with a, a list of up to 16 of these um, single origin coffees. Nowadays, um, single origin coffees are very normal um, and companies have become quite good, quite skilled in being able to um, profile those as well. Um, but um, uh, I, I would say there's still a lot of confusion and there's still a lot of uh, misunderstandings about uh, how to use, in this case, the Gießen roasting machine for that purpose. And this first webinar, um, I'm really impressed by how many attendees we have. We have 66 attendees and, and the number is still going up. Um, so these webinars really have the purpose to um, unlock some of the um, yeah, misunderstandings some of the mysteries involving um, the use of roast profiling uh, tools as um, Gießen uh, has that to the ability. Um, and we are basically going to feature in these webinars very specific topics. This first webinar has more of a general focus. Uh, we're also 
trying to um, kind of test the water to see what uh, topics are really um, um, uh, popular with the attendees. And so from that perspective, I would suggest that um, you will use the uh, chat box uh, of your um, uh, Zoom panel to indicate um, to us, you know, what um, uh, um, topics you specifically would like to see covered. I'm also going to introduce you to Marcus Young. And um, he will join us just in a second. Um, Marcus, Marcus. Um, I'm going uh, to just briefly mute myself. Briefly mute myself. Um, so Marcus is going to, he's here in the Marcus building also. And Marcus will introduce himself now. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, Marcus Young, I'm the campus director here at Boot Coffee, where a lot of our trainings and courses and research work happens on these geese and roasters. And we're really excited about these monthly webinars to um, share with all of you what we've learned about how to kind of maximize these machines and really you know, use them to put your own, your own stamp on the coffees that you're purchasing. So this is gonna be a really fun session. Um, we'll be doing some live roasting in a little bit. Um, and as Willem said, if you have any questions, please um, use the, the Q&A feature in the chat or um, we'll do our best then to get to those questions as they come or before we wrap up for the day. Thanks, everyone. Great. So I'm back now. I still I'm still getting used to all these controls that these um, Zoom um, that these um, uh, Zoom panels have. So what are we going to focus on today? As I mentioned, I'd like to focus on some, some general features of the Gießen roasters. Specifically, I would like to go over some um, key aspects that one will uh, come across when you're using a Gießen roaster. And we're going to basically focus on, you know, what is the... Um, uh, what are the specific features of the operator panels of the Gießen? Um, we will um, uh, look at a roast we just did yesterday in anticipation of this um, webinar. And um, we will also do a live roast. Marcus will be um, doing a roast here at our um, uh, training center using a uh, W6 that we have installed. And we will obviously also like to um, focus on um, the questions that you guys and gals bring to the table. And um, I think this hour will go by very quickly. I also see Mark from Gießen here. And Mark, I'm going to also promote you to the stage as panelist. So Mark, um, if you can, if you're in the position, if you could just quickly say hello to the uh, audience here. Hello? Can you hear me? A little bit louder, Mark. Okay, yeah, can you hear me? Hello, guys. This is Mark Weber speaking from Decent Coffee Roasters, Netherlands. Hello. How are you today? Great. Um, I'm very happy to enjoy the... Yeah, I'm have, very happy to enjoy your first seminar um, on web. Um, yeah, let me introduce you myself. Um, my name is Mark Weber. Uh, I'm responsible for global sales for geese and coffee roasters, and yeah, of course, I enjoyed the the video, and it was a good um, idea from our team and 
in the U.S., uh, which is, uh, of course, Willem, which we know of a long time, and um, as well as uh, David, who support us very, very well. And I'm, I'm happy to see what, what is going on. And I saw a lot of, um, let's say, uh, up following, uh, upcoming um, seminars. So I will, of course, enjoy these uh, upcoming uh, seminars as well. I'm very excited what's, what's happened. And I think it's a very good idea. And yeah. I uh, wish all the fun that we all learn from from uh, different people, from our people, and see to find more out from, uh, to make the machines better, the technologies better, um, discuss your ideas, what you have. And from our side, I can say that we have, um, yeah, uh, every week, uh, innovation teams sitting on a table and discuss all these good ideas from around the world, from our customers, to make our product better for you guys. Cool. Th thank you, Mark. Good to hear you, um, your voice. So I, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good to keep, uh, Keep stay safe, and uh, I will sit here and watch you. What um, I'm very enjoy this first seminar, and I'm very happy to be part of it. Thank you, uh, Mark. Very cool. Um, so I'm going to do a quick poll uh, with the audience. Let's see, um, and you can see. It's just one question. I'm not going to put you too much to work, but you can see we just launched a question asking you what type of Gießen roasting machine do you currently use? Um, and the uh, answers are coming in. And that helps me also understand uh, what topics um, might be more required. Obviously, mo more of you, most of you roast on smaller Gießen roasters. And I will also um, launch during, towards the end of this webinar, um, I, I will launch a poll in asking you basically what topics would be uh, interested for you all to, um, to learn about uh, for the next webinars. So from this audience, so far, 57% has 58%. Um, has, uh, so it's, I, I will wait just a little bit until we hear the results. But it looks like this audience is um, consisting of a lot of W6 users, quite a few W15 users. So um, just to come up with some more um, general comments in terms of my experiences with uh, Gießen. Gießen has been uh, actively operating in uh, North America since um, about 12 years. We have been um, involved in the first launch of Gießen here in the US. And it was really interesting when we, um, uh, we're preparing the US launch. What we did at the SCA, I think it was of uh, 2011 or 2010, we actually roasted uh, a, a very specific coffee. It was a, um, I think it was a uh, Guatemalan coffee on a Gießen. And we also did that on other roasting machines, some well-known brands to be able to highlight the unique differences of the Gießen versus other roasting machines. And so we, we followed really a um, sensory approach in trying to um, uh, yeah, display and prove the case for Gießen. Specifically, um, what came out is that Gießen machines proved to be from a sensory perspective, 
uh, really suitable to highlight uh, aromatic uh, notes, much more than any of the other machines we uh, tested. And, and why is that, I was thinking then. Um, I think very specifically, where I look at the unique uh, benefit of a, um, of a Gießen machine versus other machines is that um, the um, controllable airflow in the Gießen, I think I, I consider that as a very, very unique feature. Of course, other brands have, can have that as well, where you um, manipulate the uh, output of the roasting fan but with Gießen, they took that to the next level. And as um, some of you know, uh, there is this feature on the Gießen where you can actually modulate the internal pressure inside the machine, which modulates the um, um, airflow to a very consistent rate so that that then becomes a feature that allows you to really um, yeah, I would say navigate the roasting profile in terms of what flavor you want to create. And that's, I think, very, very unique. Um, and of, obviously, if someone asks me what are other key features, um, is that uh, what I personally like very much is the fact that uh, the roasters uh, almost all models use cast iron components and um, cast iron as a uh, uh, as a material has the ability to uh, absorb and to radiate out heat in a very gentle way and it would be very interesting to do um, more like I would say scientific research on what um, uh, the properties are of cast iron specifically in order to be able to develop the flavor profiles of coffees. Uh, but I think, you know, if you compare cast iron with uh, mild steel or with stainless steel, you can uh, find some very uh, unique differences and unique properties there. And obviously there are many other unique features that geese and uh, roasting machines have, which uh, you can always explore with David or Mark or myself outside of this uh, webinar. The intention for Gießen is not to make the webinar into just a uh, sales pitch. We really want you to get some value out of this. Um, so here's the end of the poll. So 70% of you voted, 8% um, uses the W1A. I, I don't think if you can actually see this uh, poll, uh, so 8%, four users of the W1A, 20 users of the W6, 22 of the W15, and three of the W30. Um, and as you uh, probably are aware of, um, Gießen also makes uh, uh, larger industrial machines, uh, the W45, 45 kilos per batch, 60, and then the 140, which is a very impressive uh, system. And then, um, I see that no one said that they use the WPG-1. We have uh, here in our lab, we use the WPG-1 a lot. I actually love that machine because of the fact that it gives the same um, roasting experience as a, a larger Gießen machine uses. Um, so let me close down this poll. And here you can see the actual results. Let me... Um, and I see some of you are posting some technical questions. I would say feel free to um, sent us through this chat window any technical questions that um, is relevant to the use of your machine and I will um, make sure that these get also um, conveyed to uh, the team of Gießen in the, the Netherlands as you know Gießen has done um, I think a great job over the past um, years to um, create a, uh, like a quick response system for technical um, 
uh, questions and issues and problems. Um, and from that perspective, um, you can put that to use also here through this webinar. Uh, so let me share the screen. Uh, and I have a little presentation here that I'm going to show. Great. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. So this is um, um, an overview shot of um, Boots Coffee Campus. As I mentioned, we use a uh, W6 here, which we are going to use today for our roasting session. We also have the um, WPG1 and we have a W1A um, installed here. And then on top of that, we have, um, since this is a, also an SCA certified mm -hmm. campus, we have uh, a lot of other equipment, uh, espresso equipment for espresso labs. And um, we of course have a cupping room where we do a lot of uh, cupping analysis of uh, all kinds of uh, coffees um, that we um, um, receive from clients. And I would, would want to mention that one um, uh, feature of um, the being Gießen Ambassador is also that we are here available to help you guys improve your um, uh, roast profiles. And we are basically going to launch, uh, as soon as things start opening up again, we will start launching here a public Gießen, very Gießen specific um, one day workshops where that are free for you all to participate in. The capacity will be limited to whatever uh, new regulations will be in place in regards of um, COVID-19. We typically, without those issues, we can facilitate groups here of up to um, 20 to 24 students. Uh, but now in this new era, that might be a little bit different. Plus, I also want to mention, and that will be a great um, uh, feature for the future, um, will be the fact that we can analyze your roasted coffee, roasted on your Gießen, or roasted on this other machine that you're using and you're, you want to make a, a switch to Gießen, and we can help you figure out how to do that and um, how to make the switch. This is our WPG1. This is our W1A, which we've been using for a couple of years. Uh, and this is our W6A. So first, as a first step, I, I just want to, uh, here I'm displaying the uh, user panel on the, in this case, uh, this is the panel from the W6 or the WPG1 or the W1A or the W15 and so on. So this pedal, which is the core pedal of the geese and roasters is uh, obviously um, one of the main um, pedals to be um, working on your roast. On top of that, there's also the geese and roast profiler and we are actually um, in our session of uh, next month, which is the 26th of June, we will very specifically focus on the geese and roast profiler um, and do some um, uh, different roast profiles using the profiler. And we will then also be able to share the profiles we do then with you all. On, in this session, we will focus on more um, basic, uh, uh, explanations of the Gießen system. So here we are looking basically at the main um, interface for your Gießen roaster. On the uh, left side, um, you can see the um, um, set point temperature. Right now on this um, specific screen, it says uh, 417 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, then we have uh, the actual air temperature. We have the 
in this case, EV, the beam temperature. This is a screen grab from a WPG1. Um, and then under that, we see the rate of rise, 3.4 in this case, it indicates. Um, and then on the right side, you can see the um, uh, setting of the burner. In this case, right now it displays um, 6%. And so I think there's a, um, some misunderstanding of uh, the use of the set point temperature, not with um, all users, but I, I often um, can tell that users are somewhat confused how you can use that set point temperature. I would say roughly 40% of Gissing users um, uh, uses the set point temperature to basically allow them to um, uh, uh, complete a roast without having to do too much interaction through the profiler. And um, so how does that work? So let's say I decide um, that, that I want to control uh, my roast up to 417 degrees Fahrenheit, it actually means that in this case, I allow the Gießen to apply this set point as kind of a thermostat. In this case, the um, roaster, if I set that set point at 417, in that case, the roaster will strive to reach up to a air temperature of 417 degrees and while the temperature of the actual air temperature gets closer to that set point the roaster will gradually modulate down its burner setting so um, why would that be a, a good feature i would say if you are in the business of for example roasting one very specific product again and again and again uh, where it's really about um, uh, repetition and uh, being able to consistently roast that specific product regardless whether it's a blend or a um, single origin then you know that set point temperature approach can be a really good one the um, option there could be is that in the first part of the roast where you have the, um, the pre-drying stage and in Fahrenheit that stage um, starts to really get at a roll at around 212 degrees Fahrenheit which is the boiling point of um, water so at that stage when um, moisture starts evaporating then the pre-drying stage really starts to get on a roll. And then when the Maillard reactions really start kicking in, which is around 260 to 280 degrees, that's when obviously there is a lot of development um, starting within the beam. So what one option is, is that you as a roaster operator, you could um, have three or four specific settings that you use for your set point and you gradually increase your set point while the coffee being roasted gets into a more advanced stage and that by itself can be um, a very repeatable approach without having to use uh, any uh, relatively complex profile uh, another use for the set point approach is that this is a very good tool when you're doing the preheating of your uh, roasting machine so when i'm um, getting ready to actually do a roast or a series of roasting um, on my machine then i want to uh, do some preheating we recommend at least 20 minutes of preheating and um, you can do that, you know, at a um, temperature setting that is 325 or 350 degrees Fahrenheit so that the machine will 
um, heat up to that temperature over uh, the entire time of the preheating cycle. So one other way you can use the set point is by basically not using it. And in that way, you're really going to um, focus on using your um, burner output setting and you're not even going to use your set point um, temperature setting. And in that case, you would increase your set point to a point where it's then more of a um, high temperature uh, limit safety setting. And you could, for example, put it at 450 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is by itself a good setting to prevent yourself from any uh, major um, calamities as a result of roasting. Um, I'm going to focus on some questions soon, but I want to check also with Marcus to see how far we are from doing a um, first roast. So let me stop sharing. Uh, good. And I'm going to switch over to Marcus. So uh, let me see. Marcus, you want to maybe first share a little bit of information about the coffee we're roasting? Yeah, hello everyone. Willem, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Today we are um, going to be roasting some coffee from um, Hacienda Coffee. This is a local importer and client and student of Boot Coffees. And their kind of unique story. He's a local guy, wasn't involved in coffee. John Bergman is his name, who took an interest with a community in Mexico to basically help improve their livelihoods. I think like a lot of us who think about sustainability and the importance of the producer and the whole equation. And John really made an investment. And we got to know him as he took some roasting courses here, as he also worked on his plan to import these coffees into the US and make some quality improvements. Um, so this is from Hacienda, Mexico. It's near Guerrero. Oscar Bucio is the producer. Um, about 1,100 meters above sea level. So, you know, this is a solid specialty coffee. We've cupped it many times, 85 points, um, lots of sweetness, a little bit of citric acidity, not super high density. So I'm gonna keep that in mind as I go about our roasting profile for today. So a really nice coffee. And um, I'm excited to roast it because I also need coffee to drink at home. So I will be, taking this with me. Um, Willem here just pulled a tray, so I will flip my camera. I just want to um, want you all to look at these beans. And so there's always this first step of uh, reading the coffee beans in, in order to determine how you are going to strategize your roast. So, so Marcus, if you read these beans as we're doing now, um, how, what information do you get just visually? Yeah, I mean, visually I can see they are you know, sort of medium-sized beans. They're not tiny. You know, taking a look at this, I'm, my instinct is they're about a screen size, probably 16, 17. Um, fairly uniform in color, but also not super vibrant. Um, and that correlates, I think, to the age of the coffee and the fact, you know, we've measured this coffee quite extensively and the moisture content is right around 10%. Um, so, you know, medium, medium moisture beans, also taking a look at the physical characteristics, even without measuring the density, you know, I would put these at kind of a mid high density, not super, super high density. Um, you know, 0 0.6869 when I've measured it. And what I'm seeing in the coffee to tell me that is, the texture of the beans, the sort of translucence of the coffee. And so 0 0.68, what does that mean? That is grams per milliliter. So that's you know, how much volume does a certain um, mass of coffee take up. And a very high density bean would be looking at 
0.72, 0.73, a very low low density commercial, um, sort of below specialty grade could even be in the, you know, 0 0.55, 0 0.6 density. Okay, cool. Uh, so w what is your strategy going to be for this roast? So what, what are you going to try to accomplish? Yeah, so for this roast, I'm um, roasting about a two thirds capacity batch. So I've got four kilos going into a W6A. Um, this is a totally overjuiced machine in the best possible way. Um, I can roast right at the capacity with power to spare. Um, but I decided four kilos was kind of the sweet spot for this session. Um, you know, based on that, I'm and based on what I know about this coffee, I'm going to, um, and I'll show you my control panel here. So I'm using the set point, as Willem discussed, as kind of a preheating stage. So right now I have the set point set at 350, 347, um, and will be um, charging at 340 degrees. Um, I'm gonna roast more or less manually, so I'm gonna use my burner control, not on auto, but just using the percentage of gas power. But I am gonna set my set point up to just about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, because I know this machine often at first crack, the air temperature is around 395. And by, by doing that, the set point can come in if I start to sort of hit that exothermic reaction and if the roast um, just before first crack, it should cut the flame back for me if I'm not on the ball. So, you know, to start, I'm gonna let things cool down a little bit. Um, I'm also taking a look at my air pressure and I'm starting on, you know, kind of a middling air pressure for this machine, 120 Pascals. Um, I'm going to use that to drive some more conduction earlier in the roast. And so, so what does that mean, 120 Pascal? I, I, you know, I, I bet you that some folks are wondering, you know, what, what <laughs> is that number all about? Yeah, perfect question, Willem. So, you know, many, many machines let you control the airflow within the roasting system by opening a damper, closing a damper, or by speeding up a fan and slowing down a fan. And, you know, the Giesten has a fan. This 31% here is the effort that the fan is making, but it takes it one step further because there's actually an air pressure sensor up here in the roaster. You can't see it because it's in the return exhaust, but that air pressure sensor is measuring the pascals of pressure inside the roasting system. And, and so I want to just make a comment on this, is that what drum roasters like the Giesen uh, consistently do is that they always remove more air than they can make up for. So the, to say it in simple words, you know, the roasting machine is always a little bit out of breath. And that's that number. That number which you're seeing is basically the degree to which there is under pressure. So the higher that number, the more under pressure there is. And that's a really interesting feature to use in profiling. Yeah, but we've, we've done some fairly comprehensive experiments with air pressure that um, we can share um, after this, it's on the Giesen blog, um, talking about these results. So, you know, I think with that, I'm gonna start at 120 Pascals. I'm gonna actually increase that, increase that fan speed as I go through the roast to sort of help me draw heat out of the roasting system and give me a little bit more control towards the end of the roast. So I think with that, I'm taking a look and I let my roaster get under temperature now. So I'm just gonna set that burner back to auto. And it's gonna quickly come up to my charge temperature that I'm looking for, which is 340 degrees on the air temperature. So, and, uh, I just wanted to make some comments here. Uh, what we have here is the, uh, okay. we're looking at this, Three hundred and fifty degrees. That will allow me to do that. Other screen that I can put here 
Well, that was stupid. I forgot to unmute myself. Okay. Um, you, you didn't miss anything because what I just said was just um, not that super important, but um, now that I'm not muted anymore, um, I was just explaining that Marcus used the set point temperature setting on his um, uh, roast um, um, preparation. He, he set it at 350 degrees just to get ready for the roast. And we will soon see how he is planning that forward. And I just want to make some more comments on this other screen that we see here. Uh, in this example, the setting is at 80 PA, which is the lowest setting for this under pressure. So this would be, why would you ever use 80? Um, for example, if you would want to roast a coffee with very little, relatively speaking, convection heat. So at 80 PA, the airflow is going to be effectively um, minimal for what the Giesen can deliver. And you know, there could be certain reasons why you would be doing that. Um, the maximum setting for the PA, um, it can be as high as 220 or even higher. Um, and that you would do to highlight um, specific nuances of the coffee that are driven by the acidity of the coffee. Um, and then another controllable um, feature on the right side of this panel is the um, drum rotation which in this case on this photo is set as at 50 hertz and I can increase the um, drum revolutions which also will um, allow you to um, manipulate the flavor profile of the coffee uh, very uh, effectively. Um, so let me, Marcus, you're kind of close to getting started, right, with your uh, roast. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I am ready to roll here, so. Um... Uh, so let, let's just watch him while he's getting... Oh. All right, so I've got my screen here. I'm just gonna give it a little power to get back to my charge temperature. Um, I know a lot of you probably aren't in the US where we're roasting on Fahrenheit. It's a very easy change on this roaster just by hitting the setting or the F4 button. I can quickly toggle between centigrade and Fahrenheit. So we can do that kind of throughout the roast here. But I'm waiting for this to come up to 340, actually a little bit hotter. I'm going to charge my roast with um, no gas, kind of this idea of a soak. Um, that gives me a lot of control up to my turning point, allows me to make some adjustments if I'm coming in too hot or too cool. And, and what, how do you define a soak or a heat soak? What, what would that be? Yeah, for me a soak is just an approach where I'm starting with very low or no gas on my roast, sort of letting the coffee get accustomed to the heat of the roasting chamber, um, you know, if you have a more delicate coffee, um, it's a way to help prevent scorching and some of the roast defects. Honestly, I think it's really hard to scorch coffee in a Gison, um, but it is one approach for that. But the idea being that I'm just starting with very low or almost no heat. So here I'm just letting this come down to 340, and right when it hits 340, I will start the timer. Perhaps Willem can charge the coffee into the drum right now. And you see I've got a built-in timer here. So that's just running for me. I'm just using a simple manual roast log today. Um, realizing that in the future we'll have a session that covers the juice and roast profiling. I also love seeing all of your questions come in because I do see a number of questions about air pressure and air pressure profiling specifically. Um, we can post a link to the blog um, article that I mentioned with this. And um, additionally, we can also make sure that that's covered in depth in one of our future sessions. We can really focus on air pressure. So here I'm just monitoring my temperature, my rate of rise going down. Now I'm at about 45 seconds, so I'm going to start giving it some heat. Kind of coming out of that soak. 
you can see my rate of rise coming positive now. So it was right about one minute when I reached my turning point. You can also see my set point here, which is around 399, which will automatically reduce my flame to keep me from significantly exceeding that set point air temperature. Now, if I look here at the coffee, um, one of the beautiful things about the W6 is that really nice, large sight glass. So I can really watch my coffee going through some earlier phases of um, the drying and the beginning of the Maillard reaction to that first color phase. But here I am at about a minute 45. I'm going to go ahead and take this up to what I anticipate being my maximum gas for this roast. Uh, Marcus, it's hard to see the screen this way. Um, and I'm going to, um, I just want to look at some of the questions that we received. Um, yeah, it's better like that, yeah. And so, um, th there are more questions than we will have time for today, but obviously we're going to um, do these webinars um, many more times. And I'm just going to take the first, one of the first questions that is, uh, from Rick, Rick Appleton. And he says, you know, um, in regards of the W15, I've tried using one, 110 PA pressure and also 120 PA, but anything more than 60% gas power makes the roast rate of rise really high. What's typical for the W15A? Um, so it sounds like um, Rick's roaster is operating on steroids. It's like roasting very, very, um, uh, I would say, you know, it applies a lot of heat in the um, early stage of the roast. So what I suggest, Rick, is that um, you uh, consult, of course, the technicians of Gießen, but there is a very relatively simple way for most Giesen machines to uh, recalibrate the actual heat output of the burners. And so, and in that way, uh, the 60% gas power setting uh, would be calibrated down to a um, lower output, which I think could be the best way to deal with this. Uh, and you can ask um, David or the team of Gießen in the Netherlands how to uh, do this, but I think it's a fairly easy um, solution. Um, uh, the rate of rise, again, is the rate at which the beam temperature increases. Um, in most cases, the Gießen machines are set to display that number at 30 seconds, so um, you could compare the rate of rise as kind of the speedometer of the roasting machine. It tells you how quickly you're going from uh, one point in the roast to your end point, right? Um, like right now, I see on um, Marcus's uh, roast that he is doing, the rate of rise is uh, 10.6. So around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. In this case, it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 seconds, which basically means is that if I'm at this stage at 300 degrees Fahrenheit, then uh, I can very easily plot how quickly I will be at the point, for example, of the first crack. Let's say my yeah, first crack is at 370, degrees, then it will take um, uh, 70 degrees, obviously, before I am at that first crack. So if my rate of rise is 10, then I will have seven steps of 30 seconds um, before I reach my first crack. Yeah, and to that and point, well, I'm about 30 seconds. Um, three and a half uh, minutes in this case. 
Um, and that rate of rise is also then a very good indication for how um, um, quickly you're going in your roast and to what degree you might want to power down your burner output. Um, and so I, I feel it's really essential for all of you to focus on that fundamental dynamic between um, what the rate of rise displays and how you strategize on your um, uh, burner output and whether you do this completely manual as we do now or whether you do, do this using the ESIM profiler. Um, Marcus, I don't know how much noise there is, but at what stage in the roast are you now at uh, from a bean um, development perspective? Yeah, so I, um, as you were talking about rate of rise, Willem, I was watching my rate of rise, anticipating when I was going to hit yellowing. So I'm beyond yellow now, and um, that happened at about six minutes. I'm at seven minute 15, about, well, I think, 25 degrees Fahrenheit being temperature away from first crack. Um, so I've reduced my flame output to 25% to start slowing down this roast a little bit. Can you hold your uh, camera steady so we can just see the screen? So you can see his, just hold well, it steady. I'm gonna try to shade it a little bit. Yeah. Great, ah, perfect. So 327 degrees beam temperature. Um, so if the first crack would start at 370 degrees, as I indicated before, then we have 40 degrees to get there. So at 6.7 rate of rise, you can make a quick calculation. 40 divided by 6.7 is somewhere around um, six to, yeah, about six steps, right? And we have to divide it by two because it's six steps of 30 seconds. So that means we're three minutes away from the first crack. And that's how you can navigate in this. Um, so doing your math always helps in this case. When I just switched to Celsius, I saw a chat request come in. Yeah, cool. Um, let me take another question that came in. And we promise we will get back to you, um, to you um, to the questions that we haven't been able to answer. Um, let me see. So here is a question from Sultan. Uh, he asks basically, um, so he would like to know more about the pressure concept in the drum and how it is working. So there's a, um, um, a blog we wrote um, some time ago about this. And um, I think we have mentioned some aspects on this. And Sultan, I, I don't know if you have already now been enlightened a little bit more on this topic. But you know, again, the pressure concept is really a great tool to um, uh, profile the flavor of the coffee. And the higher the pressure setting, the more airflow you apply to the coffee and the more convection heat you apply. Um, Gregory Koifman from Etika Coffee Roasters. Um, how can I use the airflow in the final stage to prevent a smoky flavor? Um, so the best way to prevent smoky flavors, and smoky flavors basically obviously develop because of the fact that the coffee, due to the process of um, uh, pyrolysis, it's generating its own heat, which accelerates the emission of roasting smoke. That roasting smoke cannot escape quickly enough. That's where the smoky flavors come from. And so an effective way would be in the final stage of your roast to increase your PA setting. So the fan will then work harder to um, uh, allow the uh, excess smoke to escape. Um, wow, well, there's a lot of questions on the PA adjustment, um, and I'm going to see if I can 
uh, there's Enrico Scurati. What effect does the coffee profile um, have through an increase or decrease of the drum speed? That's a really cool one. I'm, I'm going to um, make a dedicated webinar on the influence of drum speed on flavor profile. And we'll, we'll do some work prior to that also to um, uh, give you a cupping report. But you know, what drum speed does, the faster the drum rotates, two things happen. That means that the beans are pushed more towards the outer side of the drum, right? That's centri centrifugal forces do that. And what it also does is that the beans, because the um, drum rotates faster, the beans also rotate faster within the drum. They're pushed from the back to the front, to the back to the front, faster. So it's basically with more um, drum speed, because of these centrifugal forces, you get a bit more of the conductive heat radiating to the beans, because the beans are touching more the uh, sides of the drum, but also the beans are rotating faster through the path of incoming hot air. So you have more conductive heat and more um, convection heat. That's interesting, right? So what some roasters do where it comes to the um, drum rotation is that in this final stage of the roast, when the beans start to become uh, lighter, they have been losing already a lot of mass, they turn down the drum rotation. And that uh, will be a great feature to highlight in one of our next uh, webinars. Um, Here's a question from Ali. Hi, Mr. Boot. What's the minimum kilograms that I can roast in the W15 to set the profile before I roast the full batch? Um, so yeah, the minimum profile in order to allow the profiler to do um, an effective job, uh, the minimum batch, I would say, is 25%. In that way, the um, uh, beam temperature gauge and the air temperature gauge is still giving you relatively reliable numbers. If you go under 25%, the machine can still roast fine. I've roasted one kilo in a W15, but then your profiler is not going to be as effective. So, so I think it should be at least 25%. Let's switch to Marcus because we, it looks like we're getting in an advanced stage of our uh, roast. We are. We are nearly done with our roast here, and um, I've hit most of my targets. I have taken my gas down right here at the end to 10%. I've increased my air pressure to 160 pascals. This is a longer roast, a 14 and a half minute roast. But given that this is last year's coffee, it was lower density, a little bit drier. I wanted to extend these brown reactions as much as possible. And we're not overly long as far as our development time. We're at about 19% development time. And I'm going to end this roast right here. So a roast that's um, just a little bit darker than a cupping roast. I took just a little bit past the midpoint temperature on this roaster, or the temperature that's kind of the, the middle point between where first crack is fully underway and where second crack begins. So um, I think this will be a pretty nice coffee. A, a much longer roast than I would often take on a W6 for some of the coffees we roast. Um, you know, I know that I could do a four kilo batch of this machine seven minutes if I had some crazy profile I was targeting. But so, I think for this so, older coffee. The overall market, would you say that uh, mission accomplished or what would you do different in the next batch uh, of this coffee? Yeah, I think um, close to mission accomplished. Um, it's probably went 30 seconds longer than I would have wanted. So I would have um, 
kept my heat up a little bit longer. I made my first major heat adjustment from um, 55% down to 40% right at yellowing, which happened at six minutes. So I was happy with that drying phase. I think I would have liked to have compressed that mid phase a little bit. So probably left, if I were to do this again, I would leave that 55% gas for another 30 seconds to a minute, keep that rate of rise high and driving you to that first track. Let's see how it tastes. Let it go back. I just popped a bean in my mouth and it tastes good. This is going to be a very sweet, chocolatey, no smokiness in this in this profile, at least on chewing the bean. I think that this will be a solid batch. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Marcus. That's really cool, yeah. man. So we're, it's just amazing how quick time moves when you're having fun. Um, I'm really so happy to see all the um, response on this uh, webinar. Um, there are too many questions we didn't get to, but we'll, as I said, you know, we will get back to you. We'll do our best. Um, if you could do um, the following, then I would highly appreciate that. If you can please um, send us your email so we can uh, follow up with you guys. Um, and you can do that through the um, chat box. Just send, me, send us your email so we can follow up with some more information. That would be fantastic. Here at Boot Coffee, we have uh, ongoing um, e-webinars 